a few years ago, there were only two ways a business owner could cash out of a closely held corporation. You'd either sell the company or liquidate it. Either step was likely to make customers and employees somewhat nervous. Ted is going to describe a third option, Employee Stock Ownership Programs, or ESOP. It's a concept that's not widely understood. Ted is a partner of Lazier Capital Partners. He has deep roots in our community. His great-grandfather was president of the Columbus Chamber of Commerce. Ted is an alumnus of Columbus Academy. He holds a bachelor's degree from Northwestern and he earned his MBA from University of Chicago. Before joining Lazier, he was in senior roles at LaSalle Bank, Fifth Third Bank, Bank One, and GE Capital, as well as being a partner with Talisman Capital Partners. He's a board member of Nationwide Children's Hospital Development, Columbus Council of World Affairs, and ACG Columbus. Please join me in welcoming Ted Lape to Columbus Rotary. Hi, guys. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. all right. I did just roll off the board of the uh, um, Columbus Council of World Affairs, so I should mention that. Um, today, we're going to talk about ESOPs. Um, and uh, I've got about 20 minutes, so I'll keep it short. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to say, though, is people a lot of times think ESOPs are something, you know, that or a last resort or, or just a few people do. And the surprising thing for us um, is we're an investment bank. We help people sell to third parties as well, is that when we went out and really educated people on, on selling to a third party or an ESOP, uh, a, a vast majority were picking ESOP. So we're gonna talk a little bit about ESOPs and what's going on and you can sort of see why that's the case. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And okay. Can you guys see the oh, I'm trying to get it in? There we go. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Let me move this over here. There we go. Um, okay, so what's going on with owners? Um, the demographics are such that people are getting to the age where they want to sell. The Exit Planning Institute is a not-for-profit that surveys thousands of business owners. And what they've seen is 50% want to sell their company in the next five years, 75% want to sell in the next 10 years. 63% um, don't know their options. And uh, 70 to 80 percent of businesses that are put on the market to sell don't sell when they are trying to sell to a third party. Um, the other one other really interesting thing is 12 months after selling to a third party, 75 percent of owners profoundly regretted the decision. Okay, in the kind of the non ESOP setting, and that's all those stories you've heard about private equity firms or strategic buyers buying and kind of changing everything. 50% of exits are not voluntary, death, disability, divorce, distress, and disagreement, and 78% of companies have no transition plan. So that's sort of what's going on with owners in a nutshell from a bunch of different surveys. Um, so as you can see from that last slide, people are ready to sell. What we're seeing is there's a lot of fatigue out there. They've had their third once in a lifetime business disruption. They went through 9-11, they went through 08, 09, and now they've gone through, um, you know, the, the last year with COVID. And a lot of people are like, hey, I want to get off this roller coaster. I'm tired, I'm ready to sell. Um, valuations are very high. Uh, part of it's a combination of lower taxes and a lot of money, a lot of liquidity out there. Uh, and a lot of companies, believe it or not, even during the pandemic, had record years. <clears throat> so you're seeing a lot of people uh, really in the, in the sweet spot of, of able to sell. Um, with regard to ESOPs, 
as you're going to find out, um, there's a lot of tax advantages. So the potential legislation regarding taxes is having a huge effect and making us very, very popular. The first is capital gains. Uh, President Biden would like to take the current federal capital gains from 20% to 39.6%. He'd also like to add the 3.8% Obamacare uh, tax to uh, uh, pass-throughs, which right now they don't necessarily apply to. And then of course, when you add on the state of Ohio, 5%-ish, uh, you can see that if you're gonna pay 45, 48, 50% in taxes, if you sell your company, um, people are a little worried about that. And even if the taxes don't get all the way up there, they're worried about what they will be. Ordinary income taxes, uh, President Biden would also like to raise those. He'd like to get rid of that 20% qualified business income deduction. And he would like to uh, raise those ordinary income rates on pass-throughs and C-Corps. Um, and then on estate taxes, there's currently, you can uh, give 11 and a half million uh, each you and your spouse to your kids. That's going down to 5 million in 2025. And President Biden would like to take that down to three and a half million per person. So there's some estate planning things that people are thinking about how to get that money out of their estate if they own a company and they're going to sell it. Okay. By the way, if anyone's got questions as I go along, feel free to jump in and ask them. So what are the advantages of an ESOP? Um, I can't go into great detail on how these things work, but uh, the first one is if you're a shareholder, surprisingly uh, for middle market companies, you get a very similar price to if you sold to a third party. Um, it can pay what a private equity firm can pay because that's a financial buyer. Um, sometimes for some industries, you get a better deal with ESOPs. And for others like high flying tech companies, you're not gonna get quite as good a, a price. However, the price you don't get at closing, the rest of the money you get back uh, on a seller note with a 12% return. So you usually end up getting more money even before taxes. Then you're able to sell tax-free. The government really, believe it or not, really wants you to do an ESOP. Bernie Sanders loves ESOPs, Republicans love ESOPs. Everyone loves ESOPs, so they give you a lot of tax advantages. So there's a way as a seller, you can sell tax-free and avoid that new higher capital gains tax or any capital gains tax. Um, the other thing is, uh, oh, go ahead. Okay, I thought someone said something. The next thing is once you do an ESOP, if you sell 100% to the ESOP, you can sell any percentage you want. 100 is the most common that we see. Um, you'll usually end up as an S corporation. Whatever you are now, you change to an S corporation. And that's a flow through entity. So you know that whatever the uh, profits are, they go to um, on the personal tax return of the owner. Well, if the owner is the ESOP trust, that's a retirement plan like a 401k. And so what happens is the ESOP trust, like a 401k, has the stock of the company in it instead of having, let's say, Apple or IBM in it, it has the stock of the company. But because it's a retirement plan, it doesn't pay federal or state income tax. So now you have a, a tax-free company, okay? So the owner potentially sold tax-free, and now the company going forward is going to be tax-free, two very powerful uh, uh, things that the government's giving you. The next thing is on the corporate governance, um, not much changes there. Usually the people that were running it pre-sale are the same people running it post-sale. Um, and we can talk in more detail about how that works, but that surprises people. They thought, well, maybe the employees are gonna be voting on stuff. The employees don't actually own shares. The trust owns shares for their benefit. So the, the, the people running the company continue to run the company, hiring and firing and opening offices and all that kind of stuff, buying equipment. That doesn't change. Uh, there's a lot of benefits for the key people in an ESOP. Not only do they get stock through the ESOP and the amount of stock they get is based on what you make typically. So if you make four times as much money, you get four times as much stock. And then we also have a stock appreciation rights program, like a management incentive plan. So those key people get even more. 
Uh, and then the employees themselves do really well. And there's a lot of third-party studies that show uh, ESOP companies outperform non-ESOP companies. In the first year, you typically see a 4 to 5% productivity increase. Uh, obviously, better recruitment, better retention, less turnover, all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of statistics to prove that. Okay. Uh, if you own real estate, one of the problems with selling your company is sometimes they want to consolidate it somewhere else and you get an empty building. With an ESOP, you don't have that. Uh, and third-party sales, the good news in a third-party sale is you typically get more cash at close than you do in an ESOP. In an ESOP, you get a good amount of cash at close, but less than a third party. However, in a third party sale, usually you have escrows and earnouts, money that you have to go earn. Uh, you, you have to have certain numbers and certain things happen to get the rest of your money. You don't really have those in ESOPs. Um, confidentiality. Uh, one problem with third party sales is a lot of times everyone knows you're selling, the word gets out. In an ESOP, it's very confidential. Uh, typically, we're doing everything remotely. You don't have buyers coming through your office. There's no reason that anyone needs to know what's going on. Uh, it's an easier process. You don't have third-party buyers calling your customers, talking to all your employees. They're not digging, digging, digging like they do in a third-party sale. Obviously, they're doing due diligence, but not like in a third-party sale. Um, predictability, all of our ESOPs close and they typically close in about four months. Uh, third party sales take longer and the failure rate is in that 50 to 80% depending on what statistics you look at. Uh, and the cost, um, there are a lot of professionals in an ESOP and they get paid. However, uh, they're all paid basically by the ESOP, <coughs> um, not by the seller. In a third party sale, the seller is going to pay those costs. So those are some of the advantages of an ESOP. Um, ESOP works <clears throat> best when you have someone to run the company after you sell it. It would not work very well if someone, uh, if the owner is the whole company, if he leaves, it's all gonna go to heck and he's gonna go to Florida the day after the sale and there's no one to run it. Uh, other than that, if you have someone to run the company uh, and, and your prospects for the future look fairly good, it, it can be a great alternative. Okay, um, just a little bit about us. We are, uh, as I said, an M&A firm and um, uh, 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 ESOP uh, investment bank. Most of our deals these days are ESOPs because that seems to be the much more popular way to go. Um, we've got 21 people, we've got five accountants, five attorneys, and then the three partners. I was a private equity guy and a banker my partner, Mike Morosky, was a, um, a, a, a PricewaterhouseCoopers turnaround guy and an Arthur Anderson consultant. And my partner, Bruce, was a tax and M&A attorney. Uh, and then the rest of our professionals, evaluation people, attorneys, accountants, people, uh, bankers, people like that. Okay. And our, uh, here we go. Our role as the quarterback is we tell people up front what they would get in ESOP and then we go get it for them. So we advocate for value, structure the transaction, present options, negotiate the terms, uh, keep it in budget, move it along, keep it on time. Okay, not a commercial for us, just so you know kind of what the investment banker does. Here's some uh, Columbus companies you may know that we've helped out the last few years. Uh, just so you know who in Columbus is doing this, these ESOPs. And here's some more. You may or may not know some of these companies. Um, other companies have chosen not to have their name mentioned. So these are just the ones that are okay having their names mentioned. But you can see a lot of Columbus companies uh, have done this in the last few years. And then you're probably familiar with other ones like uh, Palmer Donovan, Allied Mineral, people like that. Um, who does ESOPs? You want to have a certain level of earnings to do an ESOP. If you're term, familiar with the term EBITDA, that's sort of earnings before um, taxes, a million and a half to two uh, and higher. 
is good because there are a fair amount of stuff you got to do to do the ESAP and size matters. 18 employees or more. There's some tests around uh, ownership of the stock. And so it, it's better if you have 18 or 20, you can do it with less, but that just makes it better. If there's no error in the company, um, you know, obviously if an owner wants to give it to their son, probably not a great ESAP. Uh, you definitely want to have management post-closing to run the, the ESAP. Uh, if sellers are confident about the company, that's better. ESOPs are meant to last. They're not a liquidation strategy. Uh, and if there's borrowing capacity, that's good because then the owner can get some cash at close. The exception to that is we do a lot of contractors and typically uh, they don't have a ton of borrowing capacity, although they have some. Um, manufacturers are the biggest category of ESOPs. You'll see a lot of white collar firms because they have elevator assets. They walk out the door at night. You want them to come back. Architects, engineers, consulting firms, software as a service, people like that. Um, small town companies, people don't want to wipe out the company. We've done a bunch in Toledo and Dayton and even smaller uh, cities. A ton of contractors do it. Contractors in the real world don't get great multiples. You get a pretty good deal with an ESOP. And there's usually not a great way to transition contractors, so it keeps everything together. Um, for whatever reason, people in the food industry love ESOPs. And so that's all those. And culturally, uh, people who have a strong aversion to paying tax obviously like the fact you can sell tax-free and that the company becomes tax-free. Um, the culture of the company is more like a family than a dictator culture, because um, one of the neat things about ESOPs is everyone starts pulling together and you get a really uplift in, in uh, productivity, but that works better if, if everyone's kind of pulling together and you don't have more of a dictator culture. Um, if, you, if the owner's worried about the legacy of the company and the company remaining intact, the culture remaining, that's great. And then if they have real estate that they want to keep a tenant for. And that's it. I think I did it in about 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> I'll go back. Uh, That's great, Ted. Um, anybody have questions? If you want to raise your hand or open your mic and speak. Ted, a yeah. question. Have you seen a situation where uh, earnings go south? Uh, people get nervous because the company isn't making money uh, in that kind of hurts morale. Uh, how do you deal with that? Have you seen it happen and, and how did it come out? Yeah, so, you know, certainly uh, you're always going to have uh, companies that um, have trouble. Um, by the way, one statistic that's kind of neat, an ESAP is a leveraged buyout, right? It's a tax advantage lever buy, leveraged buyout, basically. Leveraged buyouts in general, 19% of those fail. Uh, about one half of 1% of ESOPs fail. So, you know, companies have trouble. Um, the few that we've seen of ours that had trouble, like they lost a big client or something happened, um, have all bounced back nicely. And one reason is because one, you have friendly debt from the seller because the money they didn't get it close, the rest is owed to the seller. And two, the employees all pull together. So there was actually an article in the paper about a company uh, that's an ESOP recently that had a, a trouble. They messed up their software conversion or something and really hurt the company. Well, uh, in, in a normal company that might've taken it under, but all the employees really pulled together um, and worked hard, fixed it, and now it's doing great. And that's more, that's what we see is people care more so they, they work harder to fix it. Other questions for Tad? Yeah, this is Amanda Engel. I have one. Um, on one of the slides, you said something about a minimum number of employees at 18. What it, what's magic about that number? And is it is that a hard line or is that flexible? Or No, you can do an ESOP with any number of employees. However, if you want to do an S-Corp ESOP, which is the most powerful um, because you're, you're tax-free, there's a concentration of ownership test where um, you can't, basically this isn't the exact legal test, but five or fewer people can't own 
Um, so uh, it's helpful if you have that 18 or 20 or more because it makes that test really easy. Um, we can do an ESOP as a C Corp though, which is how all of them were done up until 1998. And then you, you, you don't have a test like that. So you could do it for any amount of people at, at that point. Thank you. So Ted, I had a question. How did, how did last year's situation, I knew some businesses you said did better, which is true, but how did that have an impact on the ESOP uh, conversion last year and, and then coming into this year? We had our best year ever, believe it or not. And we did uh, 80 SAPs in Columbus last year and 20 overall, because we have offices in um, Detroit, Cleveland, Atlanta, and Dallas. And uh, the, the Atlanta and Dallas ones are newer, but um, we, had, we had a great year and this year's starting off even better. We've already closed four or five, I think. We have, I think eight going on right now. Um, so it was, it was unbelievable. I, I think it was, Partly because we um, we probably did more contractors than normal last year. Contractors were doing really well uh, for whatever reason. You know, there was a lot of building going on. Um, and I think uh, that thing I, I said about people going through, you know, 9-11 and 08 or 9 and now COVID um, really got people wanting to do stuff. So it, um, I, if you had asked me in March, I would have thought we'd have a bad year. So that was that was a little surprising to me that we had a record year and this year looks good. Now, yeah. President Biden's helping us out though on that front. So, how about valuations? Um, so, if you have a company and, and they had pretty strong EBITDA up until last year, and then they had the bad last year, and then maybe they're coming back this year, and looks like they're back to on track and are typical. How is the COVID year gonna impact their valuations? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. The uh, valuation firms have all more or less said they could ignore, um, for the most part, uh, the bad year because of COVID. Okay. As long as there's, you know, demonstration that going forward, they're gonna be fine. Uh, the other thing though is, if they do raise tax rates, valuations for all companies, not just these ops are gonna go down some because um, the when you do a discounted cash flow and you look out at the earnings in the future after taxes, obviously they'll be lower. Um, so we have a nice window right now uh, before those rates go up where, uh, uh, you know, you still get those really, really high values. And if, if the taxes do go up, you know, it'll probably lower values a, a half a half a turn of EBITDA. Any other questions for Ted? This is Keith Pierce. Hi hey Keith. Uh, I have a question. Can, can you still have an earn out? Um, yeah. We do occasionally have an earn out and it's for one of two reasons. Um, we don't have an earn out in most of our deals, but the two situations are one last year, we would have small earn outs because of COVID, um, you know, because the future looked great, but they were coming off something bad. We, we're not having those as much this year because now they're back and doing well. Uh, the second reason is, whereas most earn outs are sort of your purchase price minus, meaning, yeah, you get the, the, the purchase price, but we're gonna take away if you don't hit certain things. With right. an ESOP, I think of the earn out as full price plus, meaning you're getting your full price that you should, but you think something great's gonna happen in the future. You just opened a new division, you just, you're gonna buy someone, I don't know, whatever. And, yep. and so uh, we'll get an earn out to say, okay, if this great thing happens, you know, we want some of that for the uh, seller. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Anybody else? Ed, uh, I know that an ESOP has to have an outside board. Uh, what advice do you give to your clients on how to choose a board of directors? Um, so normally what'll happen is you got they'll have either a three or five person board. 
and three would probably be a little more common. And two, so a lot of times we'll see like the two sellers will be two of the three people. Then you have to have one independent board member, but they get to pick that independent board member. Um, obviously, it's great if it's someone who adds value from a business perspective. It's also helpful if they have some ESOP expertise. Um, but again, it's someone that they pick. So just like any other board, you'd really like them to add some value. All right, well, Ted, I greatly appreciate uh, you being here today. And thanks, Ken, for inviting him. And um, if you want any other closing words, we're gonna, it looks like we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, thanks for having me. All right, thanks, Ted. All right, everybody have a good week. <laughs>